Now, the Lagos State Government has discovered another illegal settlement under the Osborne Bridge in the Okoye area of the state. The State Commissioner of Environment and Water Resources, Tokumba Wahab, revealed that his task force discovered 86 partitioned rooms under the Dolphin Estate Bridge in Ikoyi, where squatters pay an average rent of 250,000 naira per annum. Wahab shared the update of the ministry's new discovery under Osborne Bridge alongside a video of the shanty via his ex-handle on Thursday. The video shows makeshift apartments made with mosquito nets, wood banners and tires. Director of Abuja School of Social and Political Thoughts, Dr. Sam Amadi, joins us from the Abuja studio to discuss the discovery and the arrest of those who were living under the Osborne Road Bridge and what such crisis symbolizes for the state and the country. Did the people arrested commit an offense or is it a case of desperation without a better alternative? Is it not an apparent indication of the poverty level that is driving people into destitution? So much to impact, unpack there, Dr. Amadi. A warm welcome and over to you. A lot to unpack. Uh, thank you for having me. I, I think first, look, uh, we have to be very clear. Um, there's always tension between environmental upgrade and environmental governance, uh, urban renewal, and uh, livelihood uh, across the countries in the world, you see that. Uh, recently, there have been such light on San Francisco, some as areas of uh, LA, and other major cities in the US, where we see increasing homelessness, you know, vagabondage, if you like, people uh, living as squatters, loitering, and littering, littering the streets. And so you're going to have that perennial tension between. Um, efforts to make the city look aesthetic, productive, you know, beautiful for a class of citizens, and of course the fact that there are all these uh, disposable, you know, human beings who seem not to fit into the the, the conception of the city. But, 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 but again, the question of legality and criminality would arise if there are actual laws, you know kind of prohibiting action. So if there are no written laws that say define a crime or define uh, squatting as a crime, you might uh, not be able to have uh, valid and successful criminal prosecution. So the aspect of criminality would mean that somehow they contravene the Lagos law. Again, we've seen with issues of squatters, uh, you know, in the US where the, the court or the law kind of presumes in favor or squatters when it's seen as if uh, that's a means of sustaining their livelihood. But the key point here is what does it tell about development in Lagos? Uh, Lagos is one of the biggest, uh, you know, metropolis like in the world, uh, seventh uh, largest by GDP, richest by GDP if Lagos was a state in Africa. Uh, so a rich state by GDP calculation, but again, a very poor state by human development indicators. And poorer when you look at <clears throat> incidence of housing, you know, livelihood. I remember as a young lawyer in Lagos, uh, during the case of Morocco and all this bad year, uh, people were dislocated and they don't have anywhere to go. So, so we are seeing uh, this might be a tell or a signaling of growing homelessness, you know, poverty in the city, and the fact that maybe the housing costs, you know, needs control. And so, if people can pay two fifty for to some, you know. Um, criminal cabal or enterprise running that show. Uh, it means that really the cost of getting decent one bedroom or one room in a decent place is probably out of the reach of many of these people. So this is not like persons who are criminals who just decided to be that place. These are people who got so dehumanized that they could cope and even pay, be exploited, double exploitation. They, they are so dehumanized they could stay in those places. You know, we saw one with, with a baby who delivered probably a pregnancy there. They are, so, that, they are that dehumanized that they can accept that fate. At the same time, they are doubly exploited, that they are also not just staying there as quarters, but paying significant amount of money to persons who might even have their strong uh, you know, anchorage in, in government or important state institutions. So it speaks to a double tragedy here. One that tells a story about de housing deficit and the fact that maybe because of too much focus on private sector uh, and the concept of development that is, is quote unquote anti-people, we're not able to look at how to provide housing 
for many of the people in Lagos. We've seen in recent times also deportations, I mean, very, very tragic, deporting people to Oshun State and other places. Because the state basically is not expanding social services to capture these less you know, income persons, these persons who probably don't have very uh, viable means of livelihood, these persons who are not captured in the formal employment or wealth creation you know, uh, uh, spreadsheet, but they are part of the informal, the growing informal, and part of the illegible people who are not legible to, to, this, to, to our uh, spreadsheet, formal spreadsheet of development. So you, 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 it tells a story around maybe the need now to change governance in Lagos, create a new Lagos that is more inclusive and strong in social protection, strong in issues of housing, functional education. There were pictures of schools that are dilapidated in some of the, you know, Oshodi and other those areas that are where the low income people live. And it's look at the quality of the school environment. They, they speak, they speak a story. They tell a story about, you know, lack of government attention. So I would say, look, this is just tells you the two Lagos. The Lagos that's thriving, the Lagos of the Lakey and you know of the big corporations and high net worth individuals, and the Lagos of ordinary people who are whose lives are not bettered and who drop very low to almost illegible social class where they can you know you know you know live in such indignity and exploitation. Also, Dr. Amadi, now of course. There has been a lot of criticism regarding the approach used by the Lagos State Government in this, whereby um, um, they were, these individuals were forcibly evicted. Um, how do you see the, the approach? How do you rate the approach of the Lagos State Government? Of course, you rightly pointed out earlier on that they might have even been paying to some people that might even be, uh, or persons that might be in government. Shouldn't the focus have probably gone into finding out who is behind these um, settlements, as opposed to, you know, evicting the, these um, um, these citizens who were living there. I, I think um, as a, a growing cosmopolitan, uh, a, a, one of the largest economies of city-wise in the world or in Africa, Lagos should begin to recalibrate the balance between um, extreme legalism and being a compassionate state. For example, you, you, you could first start with thinking around how do we, who are these people who are here? What's, what's the profiling? Is it because they, are, they can end well as to get housing elsewhere? Uh, what's the cost of housing in the areas that these people could live? Um, so you, you, that will feed, give you data around city planning. So no, no, no hurry to just evict them and throw them away or even arrest some of them. You start with understand the social problem. Why would these people stay here? Like you said, who is be behind this racket? And then, so you draw out lessons for city planning, better urban renewal program that is human oriented and human development focused. Again, you also show that you understand that these people themselves are also victims. So rehabilitating them, helping them find better accommodation that's, you know, I mean, Clearly, nobody should be allowed to build ramshackle under the bridge. I mean, it's both a hazard, it's, it could be a nest for criminality, and also risky to their lives. So government will be right to say, look, we're going to allow these people to live under the bridge. But we are going to process them, know who they are, and then know why they are here, and then think around how can these people be re-established, re rehabilitated elsewhere that's appropriate for their life, where they can manage their life well, and how can we support? That's really what a government should be thinking. And if you look at the most capitalist countries in the world, whether it's the uh, cities, New York, London, uh, Tokyo, you see that they, they have real programs that okay. not just keep those um, cities productive, and aesthetically okay in terms of functionality, but also programs that cater to those who drop out of the, you know, off from the box, those who are poor, those who get unemployed, those are services that they, they focus on. So I think that the approach Lagos should have used is we should have been one of trying to solve a problem by dimensioning that problem bigger from a social science perspective. What's driving this? Who are behind this? So that even if they're going to be legal prosecution, you're going to see 
those to prosecute who created this crisis. Uh, from the stories we read from the you know popular media, is that uh, you know maybe an, a, a, a police officer was sent to keep an eye on those places. He got some kind of uh, permission from the estate close by to build something there, or from there something to stay when he's tired moves into a, now a, an estate where a, over 84 rooms are constructed, 86 rooms as a, as a ledge. So this must be a criminal you know, network. And they have to deal with that. But at the same time, you have to deal with the human beings who are trapped in this, you know, you know, collusion between social need and 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 uh, criminality or, you know, breach of law. And so in there's a tendency in Lagos State and so some of the states in Nigeria, even Abuja here, to see governance as essentially means of coercion to disrupt, to uproot, and not see governance as a way of using state's power to rehabilitate, to trans transform, and nudge people towards better things. So whether it's Pape here in Abuja, let's go and demolish it two days notice, and then the, the bulldozers are there, you know, destroying, tearing away, and the people are complaining and crying. Even when lawyers go to court, the court itself is very, you know, indolent or complicit that they don't even say, okay, there are basic rules and there are due process provisions deriving from many decades and centuries of case law. I say, what does adequate notice mean? And after that, how should government balance its obligation? If you look at the National Housing Act or the chapter of the Constitution, how should government balance its obligation for to citizens and its obligation to ensure that the city is functionally efficient? These are two virtues that government must protect. They have to make sure the cities are orderly, that law abiding, that you know, you know, traffic move, uh, uh, nobody's creating uh, a source of head hazard to others. Those are those are responsible jobs, but at the same time, they also have a responsibility to say how would citizens, you know, live in these cities, live happy, functional, contribute their own quota to natural development, and that triggers a social obligation to also see a way that we can support these persons who seem to have fallen down, and that's any theory of even even the most uh, uh, free market based economic economic uh, model would would articulate some kind of safety nets for these people who fall away. But we don't see that in the manner in which the state government, but Lagos state government over the years have developed strong muscle to push down most of this, you know, where the poor live. And so it creates the impression that there's actually a, a class war. It's, it's Dr. elitism Mandy, if, in the if worst I, type. If you know, I may just inter that, look, interject yeah. at this moment as you're speaking on, you know, the class war, the lack of a safety net and so forth. Earlier on, you touched on, uh, you know, this, a story mm. that's circulating, which is around the deportation of some of these people mm. to their states of origin or to other states. And I'm curious as to what does the Constitution say uh, about us uh, repatriating people back to their states of origin? Uh, what are the legal frameworks around this? In fact, the, the concern is very clear. A Nigerian citizen is a citizen of Nigeria, actually. They're not like a set of origin. It's, it's a political creation that uh, we, we, we have adopted and internalized. But constitutionally, we have only one citizenship. Every Nigerian citizen of Nigeria can recite access rights valid in those states. So nothing like you know, a state of origin as a way of a bundle of rights attaching to a citizen. And again, deportation is unconstitutional. Many years, in the 19, I think 1985 or thereabout, or 86, yes, on that um, uh, Shugaba Daman, Abdurrahman, Daman, uh, a opposition JMPP uh, majority leader in Brown State, then Brown State House of Assembly, was a thorn in the flesh of the ruling, um, um, I think, PRP government, uh, NPP, APN government of PRP. Uh, and they, they, they exported, they deported, they say it came from uh, Cameroon or somewhere out there. And he was deported. I mean, literally, they took him and deported him out of the country. And this matter went to court. And the court held straight away that. It's a violation of the constitutional right of a city that nobody, no state of Nigeria can be deported. So the notion that a state in Nigeria or a federal government can deport somebody from state A to B is a flagrant violation of the constitutional right. There's no such right. No, every Nigerian has a right to valid stay in any part of Nigeria as long as 
they, 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 they have legal right, meaning you have your own house or, or, or you, you know, somebody lets you in. You can stay. In fact, you can st stay in the streets. There's no Doctor. violation of law except for city law. So, so no, anybody who's been deported from anywhere, whether from Sokoto to Ouara to Calabar, is in violation of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. That does not mean that you cannot, you know, restrict the movement of citizens based on valid, reasonable, and generally applied urban laws. You can do that, no. but not as a form of extinguishing their citizenship rights. Yeah. All right, Dr. Amadi, that point you mentioned is, is so imperative. So let's just say at this point, some of those who have been you know, removed from the ramshackles are watching and, uh, and they realize that their, vi their rights have in fact been violated. Uh, are they, in a, do you, would you think that they have any, any, any opportunity to potentially seek redress in court should they choose to go in that direction, seeing that their rights have in fact been violated? I think, yes, on two grounds. First, they can maintain a class action as uh, citizens of Nigeria that their forceful removal from their abode, you know, constitutes, you know, indignity, violation of their rights to human dignity and, and right to life and, you know, right to peaceable family, depending also on the mode of their removal. That's important. Again, we can take example from South Africa, uh, where there were uh, in Cook Cape Town, there were a lot of uh, squatters. People too, went to government land, built, ramshackles like this, uh, and when the government wanted to remove them, the Constitutional Court of South Africa said that cannot be done in that way. You have to present a plan on how to rehabilitate them. So these people have a right to say on that level that their removal, forceful removal, violates their rights. Again, there's also a contractual obligation. See, look, these are tenants who somebody, you know, presented himself or herself as having the right to leave you on them a t a rent to stay under the bridge. And you don't have to assume that that's totally an unlawful action uh, on the face of it. So they could also say that actually they are tenants of value. They, they, they pay the rent to be there, probably, probably against the law, they probably don't know. So the fact that they have that, uh, oblig they have that tenancy relationship, this also creates a different layer of uh, legal liability, depending on whether the person who fronted themselves acted for government or claimed to have, you know, authority to lay that place. So a lot of legal issues, but I think uh, on the basis of human rights, a reasonable court would say that the government should show a plan how to deal with the various issues, probably their children in that, in, in those, uh, uh, in that squatter place. The, how do we ensure that these kids have, you know, places they can raise their head? Just think about immigrants who are being given cash in the U.S., given hostels to stay where they are, before they are processed to immigrants, illegal immigrants, not illegal. And think about citizens who have a place. So government has obligation to sit back and take the numbers of people who are there, look at their profile, and say, how do we ensure that these kids, these two years old, three year old, or five year old, and their mothers have a place they can stay while probably they look for a viable accommodation. So we wouldn't just put them away and doing that could be defined, in law. the judge could hold that that's an uh, extreme uh, violation of the right to dignity, to simply throw them out into out of nowhere. Right. And it's clear there's a housing crisis. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're seeing momentum gaining on the demolition of illegal structures. Yes, they're illegal uh, and they must be brought down. But we're not seeing as much energy being devoted towards creating uh, substitute accommodation for these people. Where do we find redress in between? How do we play catch up? Because it seems like politics has gotten involved uh, between you know, those two things sort of coming together. What are some of your thoughts? Well, I think first, uh, the reason why the Supreme Court said that um, Chapter 4, Chapter 2 of the Constitution is not enforceable, or at least Section 6, 6C says so, and the Supreme Court interpreted that way, is because many argue that some of the remediation should come through policy and, and uh, programmatic arrangement, not through judicial pronouncement. So you, the courts find it difficult to legislate or judici judicially decide how to deal with this crisis. So it falls back on the National Assembly and on the executive branch of government. And so two things critical here. We need a change of policy to make more investments 
in housing, or public housing. I had a, a, a quarrel with the former minister of the FCT, who was well known for his you know, bullying down, pulling down things. And I said, look, you give, we give government land to developers, and they build these estates, and they are charging very expensive, you know, very high cost. You know, the, this is public land given out almost like a, you know, a sweetheart deal, just f almost free. And government allows them to charge a lot. And then these houses are empty, these places are empty. Nigeria has a 28 million, as a 2022, 28 million housing deficit, as a 2022. So the deficit is increasing. We're not building houses, and those that are built are not occupied because the, 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 the private sector people who built it are not in a hurry to let them out in Nigeria. So I think there must be an intervention. There's a market failure in typical economic language in housing. And government has an obligation to increase this public stock of housing, low-income housing, not build for profit, but build as a form of social services that are functional. In fact, also, the, the, the building profession in Nigeria need to be more innovative. Uh, I look at our houses, probably could build cheaper and durable houses that are not this fanciful and built with a lot more local resources. It can be a trigger for boosting the economy. Wet creation could come with a massive housing project that helps with human capital development and also helps to boot, boost the economy, especially local content of the built environment, the building industry, whether it's in terms of cement or in terms of wood or in terms of different man, man, uh, human labor and all that. So it, it could be a win-win. Government is providing for the citizens and helping to rebuild human capital that feeds back into productivity and also creating jobs and expanding the economy. I think we need a strategic idea around providing housing. When I used to be chief executive of NEC, I would put up a real fund to help all our staff acquire housing. Let's just say people used to worry. Why do you have to put the money? I said, you can't have citizens who are working and that's a sensitive place, and they don't have their own homes. And you expect them to be honest. So I think that the, the, the lack of homes for Nigerian people not just contributes to you know, poverty, but also contributes to corruption. People really, the first primary concern of a family would be where they live. So if, if they can't afford the, the rent, if they don't have their own houses, then they're likely going to be thinking around what they can do in a desperate way. So I, I think there's need now for government to focus on the housing sector, uh, not in the way we are doing, you know, assessing to, to private sector and, and don't control how much the cost of the what they build and the cost of what they rent out. We need to you know, recognize a market failure here, a very grand one, and government has to step in and, and provide this housing in the most economic way, knowing that we need to have our people, you know, have decent place they live. It's part of human right. But beyond that, it's also a very important driver of economic development. And so it's win-win. It's win for human rights for those who are uh, homeless currently, and also win for government that needs to reboost re 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 the economy. Dr. Samamadi, you've done justice to this topic and we always appreciate your insight here on Newsday. Thank you so much for joining us.